Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest Technology Networks webinar, The Rhythm of Life, using microfluidics to mimic blood flow in single and multi-organ on a chip models. I am Audrey Duborg, Product Manager for CNBio, and I'm here to moderate the event. I am pleased to have Graham Broder and Alicia Bray joining us today as your presenters. A warm welcome to you both. Graham has spent more than a decade in the development of biotech solutions for direct medical and life science use. Experience highlights include bioassay development on microfluidic and electroweighting platforms, chemical sensor design, medical device development, and regulatory approval of development of engineered environments for microphysiological systems. Graham was awarded a PhD in chemistry from the University of Southampton in 2009. Alicia has been with CNBio for over two years now, working as a scientist in our biology team. Her time is mostly spent developing novel organ on a chip models, such as our gut liver multi-organ and lung models. As well as performing research using our Physiomimics MPS system, she also works collaboratively both internally and externally on the development of new and innovative projects for the expansion of our microphysiological systems portfolio. Alicia was awarded an MSc in Cell and Gene Therapy from University College London in 2017. Following the webinar, we will have a Q&A session and we welcome any questions that you may have. You can submit questions for the Q&A session at any time during the presentation. To ask a question, you should enter your question into the box on the right hand side of your screen and click send. We will answer as many as possible during the time available. For any questions we do not have time to get to, we will be sure you're contacted offline with an answer. If you experience any technical issues, please click the chat icon on the bottom right corner to request support. Please remember, you can ask questions at any time, even whilst watching the webinar on demand. So, without further ado, I will now hand over to Graham and Alicia. Enjoy. Thanks, Audrey. So one of the major intents of organ on chip technology is to close the gap between in vivo studies and traditional 2D in vitro cell culture. Achieving this aim by engineering a miniaturized artificial environment closely matching physiological normality. So key features of this often include the use of 3D cultures to replicate natural tissue morphology and cell-to-cell -cell interactions, um, the use of human cells um, favoured over cell lines, and the integration of fluidics to improve nutrient supply and handle waste management. And one of the, the key aims is to achieve translational relevance um, in drug studies. Much of the data we're presenting today was gathered using CN Bio Physiomimics Organ on Ship technology, which is shown on screen here. Um, this constitutes a universal control unit coupled with interchangeable tissue culture plates. And these plates have multiple designs tailored to different target tissues. Um, it's a design to be very operator friendly, um, simple to set up. And it's ideally suited to life science and pharma research with a low binding PDMS free approach. The two examples of the disposable tissue culture plates are shown. First of all, we have our T12 plate, which is a trans world model. Um, there's 12 trans wells on a plate, all perfused um, by the Physiomimics platform. And this enables um, all on chip barrier models to be developed. So skin, gut, and lung are, are examples that, of tissues that can be grown in this way. And our second example is an LC12 liver chip, specifically designed to uh, mimic the liver microenvironment uh, and grow liver tissue. And this incorporates a scaffold where the liver cells and liver tissue grows. 
I'd like to describe how we approach design of the tissue microenvironment. Firstly, it's impossible to actually shrink complex tissue and retain all aspects of its scaling. Uh, there quite literally isn't a one-size-fits-all approach here. However, it is possible to focus on specific tissue functions and assay types, drill down to identify their most important, uh, their most influential features uh, and capture these in an engineering solution. So some examples of variables and features which are potentially relevant are listed on the right hand side. Um, one of which which is almost universally important is media flow, uh, capitulating, recapitulating the, the blood flow. So what do we mean by flow? Often we think of mil per minute or microliters per second. And really this is bulk flow. And in isolation, it translates poorly uh, with regards to impact on tissues. Uh, rather, it's the combination of bulk flow with the vessel's shape and size and dimensionality with the physical properties of the fluid, um, which determine features, aspects of flow, which actually do impact your tissue directly. Um, so some of these aspects would be uh, flow velocity and shear, which, which occurs against surfaces, um, such as uh, tissue surfaces, um, but also determines properties of uh, molecular diffusion. So nutrient supply, uh, waste product removal. These are key aspects which do affect your tissues. Another area that we will touch on in a minute is the flow profile, whether or not this, the flow you're generating is continuous and smooth or whether it's pulsatile. And I'll say we'll touch on that in a minute. I just wanted to highlight other clever things that you can achieve with flow, um, one of which is particle positioning and orientation. When I, when I say particle, I also mean uh, cellular. Um, but with with using properties of the flow and the dimensions of your vessel, you can actually orientate naturally where, where your tissue, where your free circulating cells are residing within the channel. Focusing on flow profile, this is very important to get right. So many pumps, including many of the designs used on microchips, uh, generate quite a pulsatile flow. However, typically the tissues desired to be recreated on chip are served by a capillary network, which has a largely continuous smooth blood flow. So to deal with this, C and Bio's plates tackle this by incorporating fluidic structures, such as flow dampeners, to convert from a pulsatile flow to a continuous flow upstream of the tissues. And the graph at the bottom here shows an example of that in action. Uh, we, we actually have three flow profiles here. The first section, the second section, the third section. All of these regions have exactly the same bulk flow of one microliter per second flow. Um, but as you can see, their flow profile is very different. And this is just due to that dampening. Uh, we've gone from a completely undampened system where the, this is the nature of the pump acting through to a heavily dampened system where that flow, that very same flow from the very same pump is smoothed out uh, and much more capillary like. So looking deeper into our different tissue culture plates, uh, shown here is the designs of the LC12 liver plate. And this incorporates key features to control the biological, physical, and chemical microenvironment around the tissue culture. As previously detailed, um, we have 3D tissue scaffolds on which the liver cells reside, um, and these create 
optimal cell to cell interactions in a 3D structure. Uh, we have a moderated um, flow of media, so it is smooth and continuous, and at a physi physiologically relevant flow velocity. And we've also got reoxygenation regions. So the fluid as it's circulating and gets deoxygenated by the tissue goes through a reoxygenation region before going round to the tissue again. And on the right hand side here, you can see some of the results of our CFD, our computational fluid dynamics modeling, uh, which we incorporate into our development structure. So this is a powerful design and analysis tool. Um, and it really gives us the nature of the physics. It tells us about the nature of the physics at the microscopic level in terms of what really affects the tissue, in terms of that flow velocity, oxygenation, shear. Um, and it really generates invaluable data for, for the design of our physiomimics plates. And to briefly introduce you to some of our other tissue culture plates, uh, we have a T12 um, perfused transwell plate for use with barrier models such as guts or lung tissue. And we have multi-organ plates such as the TL6, uh, which combine the essential elements of the liver chamber and the transwell barrier chamber uh, to have a, a multi-organ model and enable much more complex studies. And Alicia will explain further how our plates, including the multi-organ plates, can be powerful tools for research. Thank you, Graham. Now that we have a clearer understanding of what flow is in an in vitro setup, I will talk to you about the benefits of flow on different in vitro organ models. As discussed earlier, flow is an important in maintaining cell functions as it helps recreate the shear stress seen by the cells in physiology. It also ensures that cells have a sufficient nutrient and oxygen supply. We first asked whether adding flow to a standard 2D monoculture of primary hepatocytes had any benefits to the cells. What we can see here is that when a 2D standard monoculture of hepatocytes is placed under a circular flow, this leads to improved morphology of the tissue. We can see here cells under flow have a formed cobblestone-like morphology rather than their counterpart without flow. Another interesting benefit of having flow is that the cell, cells have an increased metabolic activity. What we observed is that cells under flow seem to have a fourfold increase in metabolic activity when compared to the cells without flow. This shows that even under standard 2D in vitro conditions, putting cells under flow is beneficial. Working with cells in a 3D structure brings more challenges than in 2D. It is more challenging when trying to fulfill the cellular demand for nutrients and oxygen within three-dimensional tissue. If we take spheroids for example, it is well known that cells in the center of a spheroid can become necrotic over time due to poor access to oxygen and other nutrients. Harnessing the power and benefits of flow is a way to overcome these limitations, aiming to provide cells within a 3D tissue structure with an adequate level of oxygen and nutrients. Here at CMBio, we have used a 3D liver scaffold whereby media is continuously perfused through the microchannels, containing cells which allows the cells in the tissue to access oxygen and nutrients. This 3D liver microtissue recreates the microarchitecture seen in the liver, displaying polarization of the hepatocytes, as we see on the microscopic images here. Liver cells are known to be highly metabolically active, so we wanted to see whether the flow had any effects on the liver cell function of the 3D microtissue. Interestingly, what we saw when seeding cells under flow and then either continuing or stopping the flow three days post seeding is a drop in liver cell function for the cells with no flow. This shows how greatly the flow improves the liver cell function. 
What is also important to mention is that in our particular configuration, it is possible to do long-term cell culture for over a month with a conserved phenotype, cellular and metabolic activities of the 3D liver microtissue. This data so far has shown that the fluidic flow is critical in enabling the creation of 3D liver tissue. And these tissues can be and have been used for a variety of applications in the late and preclinical stage, such as pharmacology, DMPK, drug safety and toxicity, hepatotoxicity, ADME, as well as disease modeling and even drug repurposing. Standard in vitro gut models mainly use KCO2 cells, which are known to have a very tight barrier and with very low permeability, which is not physiologically representative of the human gut and makes it challenging to study drug absorption in the gut. To overcome this issue, we have developed a co-culture model using KCO2 and goblet-like cells under a circular flow in the transwell setup in the T12 system in which the tissue is seeded onto the basolateral side of the transvaal to be in direct contact with the flow. When the co-culture gut tissues are put under flow, the flow generates a change in the morphology of the tissue as we see here. The gut tissues under flow have an increased tissue depth with the formation of a crypt-like structure which gives this originally monolayer type tissue a 3D-like structure when compared to the gut in a static condition. When measuring the transepithelial electrical resistance, or the TIA, we see that the barrier integrity is more human relevant in the MPS system with flow, as opposed to without flow. According to the literature, the human gut barrier has a TIA ranging around 100 centimeters squared. What we can see here is that the MPS gut model has TIA in these ranges, whereas the static gut model goes up to 4,000 ohms per centimetre squared. As the barrier strength is going down, what we would expect is the permeability of the tissue to increase, which is exactly what we observed here when running a basic dextran absorption assay. Dextran was added to the basolateral chamber and dextran levels were measured over time in both the well and the transvaal. This showed an increased passage through the gut tissue into the transvaal chamber and in our model compared to the gut tissue under static condition which confirmed that our 3D like gut tissue has an increased permeability. This data shows that our MPS gut model is more physiologically relevant to the human gut and that even a circular flow has benefits to an in vitro organ model. Similarly to our liver on a chip model our gut on a chip can be used for a variety of applications such as drug absorption, metabolism, toxicity, disease modeling, as well as inflammation, but it could also be implemented for the study of the gut microbiome. In a current in vitro 2D and 3D model, often they don't allow for multi-organ interactions, which are essential to further our understanding of the implications in human physiology. Adding a multi-organ configuration to our Physiomimics platform has always been our ultimate goal. As Graham showed you earlier, we have developed a two-organ model system using our gut and liver models. The gut and liver chambers have the same configuration as their original single-organ model, organ models to conserve the standard flow within each tissue. But in addition, these two chambers are now interconnected and allow crosstalk between the two organ tissues. The first important conclusion is that the interconnection is not impacting on the liver or the gut tissues. Their morphology is conserved between the single to multi-organ platforms. The function of the hepatic cells is conserved within the multi-organ platform as we see on the albumin graph, showing similar values to that seen on the liver chip platform. Gut barrier integrity is also conserved from the single to multi-organ platform. This shows that the new connection between the two organs does not impact on the two tissues. Once we established that the new interconnected flow between the two organ chambers was not impacted on the tissues, we assessed the crosstalk between the two organs by adding dextran into the gut chamber. First, what we observed is that the gut tissue permeability is similar to that in the single organ platform. 
But more importantly, over time, dextran is transported into the liver chamber, showing the communication between the two chambers. What this data shows is that flow is crucial for the formation of physiologically relevant tissues in vitro, but also to allow crosstalk between the two organs in a multi-organ platform. This gut liver platform can be used for different applications such as DMPK, metabolite driven tox toxicology, or even inflammatory crosstalk. When working with flow, it is important to acknowledge that the scaling of all aspects is an in inevitable challenge. It is imperative to identify the most critical physiological features to develop organelle chip models successfully. Here, flow is really about fluid dynamics and many physiological features that are directly or indirectly governed by it. This flow allows for the generation of more human relevant tissue with conserved morphological features and functions for long-term culture whilst allowing for the ability to make organ crosstalk available in more physiologically relevant studies. Thank you very much for listening and we are ready for any questions. Thank you very much to Dr. Graham Browder and Alicia Bray. I'm sure you will all agree that there were some excellent points raised during the presentation. So we will now begin the Q&A session. To submit a question to our speakers, you should enter your question into the box on the right hand side of your screen and click send. We will answer as many questions as possible during the time that we have available. We have already had several questions submitted and so we will be moving straight on to these. The first question that we have had through is what goblet cells are used? HT29? Uh, yes, goblet cells are HG29 MTXE cells that are used in this model. Thank you very much, Alicia. The next question that we have is, don't you want a less permeable gut? Prevent inflammation slash infection. So our permeability of the gut is designed for transport of nutrients and other things. So we want a physiologically relevant, relevant permeable gut. So we don't want it to be too permeable, but we also don't want it to be too tight of a barrier. Thank you so much, Alicia. The next question that we have is, is there a physical exchange of liquids and or nutrients between the organs in the two organ model? So what we have is a circulatory system in the liver compartment going round and a circulatory system in the gut compartment going round. And then we have a, a third system bridging the two, flowing liquid from the gut and the liver. So any, any nutrients or biomarkers released by any of the tissues um, would be would diffuse and mix and, and go between the two compartments and the, and the two tissue types. So in short, yes. Thank you so much, Graham. Our next question, what platforms are used for CFD simulation? Are they developed in-house or commercially available? For example, console. Um, so we're using um, a program called Open Foam which is open source um, modeling software. Uh, we don't actually do the simulation ourselves. Um, we're working in partnership um, with a company which provides that expertise as a service for us. Um, and that way we're, we're sort of combining our um, fluidics and biological expertise um, with the, um, the CFD and physics expertise that those those that company provides the best of both worlds thank you so much graham our next question is what do you mean by human relevant properties of gut barrier and then we have in brackets ter value yeah so human properties of the gut barrier we do measure the tier value we also measure the permeability so anyone who has worked with any gut organ on chip models should be aware or may be aware that kiko 2s produce a very high tier value and very low permeability so 
in a physiological model, obviously this is not the case. You do have some permeability in your gut. Um, we don't want it to be too tight so that the nutrients and things can't pass through. For example, if we are using the multi-organ plate, we need the nutrients to pass through from the gut into the liver so that the liver could metabolize any drugs or anything we're putting in there. So yes, we do measure tear, permeability, and uh, various other markers. Excellent, thank you, Alicia. So our next question, you mentioned continuous flow for your liver model and pulsatile flow for your barrier models. How different are these flows in each OOC plate? And how critical is the type of flow to an organ model? Okay, um, so how different are they? They're, they're quite different, um, but it doesn't just stem from the pump or whether or not there's a dampener. It also stems from the sort of morphology around the tissue um, and sort of the greater structure in the well. Um, so in the case of the liver, um, having a dampened flow is essential. Um, the channels where the liver tissue resides uh, represents a flow restriction. So flow velocity, um, would sh sh it shoots up in that region. So dampening the flow, making it much more capillary-like is essential. In the case of the gut, it's a much more open structure of a well um, in terms of where the tissue sits. And so the requirement for actual dampening um, is, is massively reduced, in fact, to the point where um, having dampening um, would impart no biological um, benefit. Um, and I think the second bit of the question, um, how, how essential is it to get right? Um, I think it's pretty damn essential. <laughs> um, it's essential to optimize the flow for each specific organ um, that, that, that we have, and you can run on these plates. Um, the, the trickier question is knowing what aspects of the flow to optimize. Um, obviously, for some organs, velocity and nutrient transport are the prevailing factors to focus on. For other organs or tissues, uh, surface shear might be the more important. Uh, and it, it's knowing where to focus your efforts, I think is important. Um, you, uh, as we said earlier, um, it's very difficult to control all aspects. Uh, and so you've got to be very selective. Thank you so much, Graham. We have time for two more questions. The next one that we have had through is what were the biggest challenges you faced when developing your multi-organ on a chip plate? <laughs> um, don't know about the biggest challenges, but probably one of the most frustrating, I'd say. Um, it, I mean, it's common. It's the nature of um, prototyping and, and product development. But um, where you're working off very uh, small batches and small batch manufacture, um, you tend to have um, a greater plate-to-plate -plate or batch-to-batch -batch variability in your prototypes than you would expect to get when you have a, a product um, and an established um, production line for that product. Um, and so it's a bit of a frustration when you're developing and you're trying to optimize designs and sometimes your designs do not work, but it's not because of your design, it's because something may have gone wrong and in the unoptimized manufacture. Um, it's perfectly normal, as I say, for product development. Um, and you know, one, one mitigation, I think, to bridge between um, prototyping and small batch manufacture to your full manufacture um, and uh, an established product is to have, well, it tends to be costly, but a short-term 100% QC of your product to at least identify and eliminate when parts are not quite up to spec. Um, but as I say, it's, it's, it's normal, it's run of the mill for product development for it to have these frustrations. Perfect, thank you so much, Graham. So our last question for today's webinar, how do you manage the media in the flow for different organs? 
Um, so if this, yeah, I, I mean, we, we've got a number of tools um, that we can use to optimize the flow to different organs. Um, we obviously can run the pumps differently and we can add lots of different structures. I think when, when you're talking about the media from a chemical point of view, um, it because the same media is going to the different organ types, you, you have to optimize your media to be amenable to, to both types uh, or to all your biology. Uh, would you agree, Alicia? Yeah, I would definitely agree, Graham. Perfect. Thank you so much, Graham and Alicia. That's all that we have time for today. Just to remind everybody that any questions we didn't have time to get to will be answered offline as soon as possible. And you can continue to ask questions even when watching this webinar on demand. A certificate of attendance is available to download from the handouts tab on the right hand side of the webinar platform. And the webinar will now be made available on demand. If you have any friends or colleagues that you think may be interested in this webinar, please feel free to share the link. Thanks again for your time today.